Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. So we've heard a lot about AI now. And I think not just at this event, but in general. This is what everyone's talking about, whatever industry you're in at the moment. And as someone who actually researches in this area, I'd like to talk a little bit about where things are going and where we're you know, making this transition from where we are at the moment to what the future is starting to look like already. So out of all the things AI can do, one of the useful ways of thinking about it is as a process for doing automated decision making. Right? So if you're trying to recognize faces in a crowd, right, there's a decision you have to make. Does this group of pixels correspond to a face or something else, a tree, a cat, a dog? You can think about many problems in this way. Right? If we're trying to detect if some transactions are potentially fraudulent, again, there's a decision that needs to be made here. But these are very specific kinds of decisions. If you, if you look instead at a different kind of problem, say you've got a robot working in a warehouse or a factory, this is a different kind of decision. Right? What you might want to do here is think over a longer term. You might have some question, like, can I get my robot to help me build something or to pack things on shelves or unpack them? Now, in this case, you can't think about one decision. Are these pixels representing a face? You've got to think, what should I do next? And then what do I ne do next after that, and do next after that, and so on. So where this is different is if it decides to take a step to the left or a step to the right, this has no immediate value, but this affects something down the line. We're trying to achieve something. And so I'd like to focus on this kind of decision making for a little bit, and then talk to you about why this is important. So in the world of machine learning, in the world of artificial intelligence, we call this field reinforcement learning. Now, this is a, a technical term, I know. But as someone who works in the area, it's been very interesting that it was always considered a bit of a niche side area that nobody really wanted anything to do with until the last couple years. Right, so deep learning has been all the buzz in all the machine learning circles for the last coming up on a decade now. But interestingly, at some of the big conferences last year, there was a bit of a, a change in direction. And that's at this area, this reinforcement learning, started taking off and actually surpassing deep learning as the most spoken about topic in the academic circles. Now, it always takes a while for stuff to climb its way out of academia and into the real world. So I thought I'd give a little bit of a sneak peek into what this all is all about. So as a field, unsurprisingly, given how I started, this is about making sequential decisions. So we look at this as a form of machine learning that deals with something that's a, a qualitatively different problem to what we generally look at in the AI space when we talk about AI in any kind of business setting. So let me give you a little bit of a sneak peek and an under-the-hood look at how this actually works. The way we think about these problems is that we've got some sort of a decision maker that's acting in some environment. I'm going to use this example of a robot just because it's nice and visual and easy to explain. But this can apply to a whole lot of different settings, and we can talk about some of those cases. So what needs to happen here, again, unlike that original case, is we're making a whole lot of decisions. So we've got this paradigm where, at any point in time, our robot might need to take some sort of action. And this could mean stepping in a different direction. This could be picking something up. This could be interacting with other robots or other people. Um, but it's got to make this choice. And that's the important thing that we care about. When this action gets taken, what happens is the environment changes state. Now, typically, something happens when you make a decision. And this is why there's a point in making a decision. Right? So this, might be the, this environment state might refer to something as simple as a mental state or something as obvious as whether a door is open or closed and whether my arm is extended or not. So what happens here is I'm repeatedly going to choose an action, and something happens as an effect of that. Now, critically, what's different here to your standard machine learning paradigms is we could also get some sort of reward from the environment. And this tells us that we've done something good or bad. And this is really the essence of what we want to capture here. So given the setting where I can make decisions, I can make changes to the environment, and some of these are good or bad, it's worth asking, what is the right thing to do in this setting? And this is what we call a policy. 
And a policy or a behavior or a strategy is really something we follow, something that's kind of giving us advice or guiding us along the way of what we should be doing at any point in time. Now, it's very easy to talk about policies, but we're all here to do something as well as we can. And so we care about what's called the optimal policy, right? Because if there's certain things that are good and bad in the world, what I want to do is I want to follow a strategy that is maximally good for whatever I care about. OK, so that's nice and abstract. I'm going to look at a very simple example here to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So you could have a robot these days that cleans your house. That's very cool. So these little Roombas, these little robot vacuum cleaners can drive around and um, usually just follow set patterns. But imagine now we've got the case where we want one that's intelligent. We could describe the simple case where maybe your house consists of these 12 cells, just because we're being ambitious here. And you might want this robot to go and find this pile of dirt that's in the top corner there. And maybe we're going to describe this as saying, when you find the dirt, I'm going to give you a positive reward of plus one. This is a good thing, because you're a vacuum cleaning robot. On the other hand, I haven't been great at maintenance, and there's a hole in my floor. And if you find this hole in the floor and fall into it, I'm going to give you a reward of minus one. So this is just a very simple way that we're encoding behaviors in terms of what we do and don't desire as the outcomes. Now, because this is machine learning and not human learning, the whole trick of this is for the robot to figure out what to do by itself. And by that, what I mean is I want to find an optimal policy. And in this case, this optimal policy is the strategy of wherever I am in this, in this house, what is the right thing for me to do if I'm trying to get as much reward as possible? So this is just a very simple caricature of the kinds of processes we're talking about. Now, clearly, if you look at this, what's really important is the choice of these rewards. Right? If, I'm, if I mess up and mix the plus one and the minus one, I'm going to get disastrous behaviors coming out of this. And as with any other technology, these kinds of choices are important. So it's worth thinking about these rewards and what they mean for a little bit. Right, so typically, we use this to encode either desirable behavior or undesirable behavior in terms of what we'd like achieved. So this might be um, winning or losing some scenario. This could be avoid collisions, avoid falling in holes, um, try and uh, minimize your fuel costs, or even try and preserve the value of human life in some way. And, and this follows this kind of general psychological notion of the kind of carrot versus stick scenario. We can use these positive rewards to incentivize moving towards something and negative rewards to avoid it. Now, that seems easy enough. Let's just figure out all the things we like and give them positive rewards, and vice versa for the negative ones, and then have these systems learn how to act in these environments. So that's great. But anyone who's ever had to set KPIs in a company will know it's really hard to just come up with a list of things you want your employees to do, and then they'll optimize that without finding any loopholes in your logic whatsoever. So I, I like to think of one particular example in this scenario, which was in the early 1900s when Hanoi was under French colonial rule. What happened was they had an outbreak of rats. But there were so many of these things running around the city that the government didn't know what to do. They came up with a cunning plan. They decided what they would do is crowdsource this. So they were going to get the population to go out and capture and kill the rats, and that would get rid of the problem without them having to do anything about it. Now, obviously, to do this, you have to give some sort of financial incentive. So if somebody could prove that they'd killed a rat, they'd pay them. Now, obviously, being the intelligent government officials they were, they didn't want piles of rat corpses lying all over their offices. So they decided, OK, we'll just, if you bring us a rat tail, we'll pay you for that. Unfortunately, this didn't seem to help. So the rat problem didn't just go away, but now there were an awkward number of rats running around without tails. And in fact, it was a little bit worse than that, because people started catching and breeding rats so they could cut their tails off to get more money out of it and became quite a lucrative industry. So even a simple incentive scheme like this, just bring us evidence of these rats and we'll pay you for it, can have very obvious flaws. Now, this obviously has a number of challenges and potential problems if we want to think about these kinds of AI systems, which are typically slightly better at optimizing than people are. So this is one major problem. But the other thing that's important to think about is if you want to make a good decision, it's not just good enough to think about 
out of all the options I have available to me right now, what will give me the best payoff? In this kind of example here, you could say taking one step to the left might give you a reward of one rand, but taking five steps to the right will give you, say, 10 rand. In this case, if you just think in the short term, just one step left or right, obviously you should go left. But that's not what's important for making these kinds of decisions. Now, in a technical sense, what we think about in getting our systems to deal with these problems is there's some sort of value you want to be able to estimate for each state of the world, for each configuration you might find yourself in. So if I'm thinking about going to the right, I actually want to estimate that if I follow this course of action in the long term, I'll end up with something much better than the immediate action going to the left. And this is just an important principle in making decisions in general, which unfortunately we don't see many people following in the real world. Now, what does this value really mean? So this means if, say, you've got this little robot that needs to wander around some environment, and maybe in the top corner over here, we'd get like a reward of 100 for reaching there. As I'm wandering around this environment trying to learn, I'm gathering no information about what's good or bad. It's only when I really encounter the state that I get some idea of, aha, this is what the designer wanted me to achieve. And so this notion of value is something that we have to learn through experience of our systems that we can kind of back propagate through the system to say, all right, if I know this is 100 and now I know how I got there, I can estimate how good the states nearby that were. I can start propagating this value to other situations in the world. So to, to technically deal with this problem, what we do is we treat these agents in a different manner to the standard supervised learning case where you come up with a huge data set that has to be annotated. And what you do is you have to give your agent access to the environment you care about and they learn by trial and error. So they'll go around trying different things and seeing what happens. Sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen, and sometimes neutral things happen. And from all these experiences, I want to start learning about the world and learning what happens as I do different things. The effect of this then is that I start building up some knowledge about this environment and how this works, what are good and bad decisions at different points when I'm thinking about the long-term consequences of everything I do. So this is a little bit about how these systems work. But what are they doing? Now, this is a field that's relatively in its infancy. There's very little adoption of this into real-world applications as yet. But let's look at what this is capable of achieving. So I'm going to show you a very simple example here, which is one of these AI systems learning to play a video game. It's an old video game, one of these Atari games of Breakout. But what's going to happen here is we want to watch this learn over time. So when it starts off, it doesn't know anything about the environment. In fact, this example I'm going to show you here, all it knows is that pixels exist, and I've got some directions I can move my paddle in, except it doesn't know that there's a paddle, or it doesn't know that pushing the left arrow key will move the paddle left. So it has to learn everything itself. When it starts learning, it obviously doesn't know anything about its environment, um, because it hasn't learned anything yet. So you can see here, it's acting kind of randomly. Sometimes it gets a good shot in, but most of the time it just loses, right? It's just picking whatever randomly happens next, as it hasn't yet learned what the effects of the state of the world are on the actions it should take and what might happen in the future. But if you leave a system like this gathering experience and trying to generalize from its experience for long enough, what happens is it learns to start optimizing what's going on here. It's getting this feedback, which is the number of points it's received, and that's what it's trying to optimize. So using these simple principles I've discussed with you today, you can learn to perform in these sorts of settings. Now this is playing at the level of whatever passes for an expert playing this game. But what's interesting is if you leave it even longer, it will start exploiting the reward function you've set up for it, as I alluded to earlier. So in this case, it's learned a bit of a trick that can help it play the game even better. Right, so this is after four hours of training, starting off knowing nothing except that pixels and arrow keys exist. And it's already learned to hack the system. Now that's just a simple game. What can we do that's more complicated? So this is the game of Go. So Go is an ancient Chinese board game, and it's often described as what chess experts graduate to when they get bored with chess. It's actually a very simple game. So it's played on a 19 by 19 board, and the two players take turns placing either a white stone or a black stone. And the whole point of the game is to capture territory. So you surround your opponent's pieces, and then you own that territory. Now, 
This has been considered for a while now the grand challenge of AI. So it's considerably harder than chess for a number of reasons. But mostly, you've got 361 moves available to you when you start the game. The game typically lasts much longer than a game of chess does. There's obviously an opponent. But if you look at all the different configurations of stones on the board, and I know these kinds of numbers get thrown around a lot, but there are more configurations that that board could be on than there are atoms in the universe. So it's a very difficult game. You can't just reason about every possible successive outcome that you might encounter. You've got to be, do something more intelligent than this, which is presumably what experts do. I wouldn't know. I'm not an expert. So anyway, this is the grand challenge. And it was assumed to be about 25 to 30 years away from solving this, except that's the face of the best player to have ever lived, losing 4-1 to a system in 2016. Now, what's interesting is this is a complicated decision. As I said, you've got about 361 moves you can make in the game. The game might last for hundreds of turns. And there's a lot of strategy employed here. Now, the system that beat him, interestingly enough, uh, the team at DeepMind that built this spent months building the system. They put a lot of human expert knowledge into the system and allowed it to learn by watching millions of expert games that were played online. A year or so later, they came out with a successor version, which had no human knowledge whatsoever and had never watched a human game. All it had done was play against itself in the manner I described earlier through exploration. And it could beat the previous version that beat this guy in 100 games. And that learned in 72 hours how to do that. And just to show that this had no knowledge of the game itself, they then unplugged the Go simulator from it, plugged in a chess simulator, and within four hours could beat all the state-of-the-art chess uh, playing AIs. So this is a system that has no extrinsic knowledge of the game that's just playing around with it and learning the rules of it and learning how it works. But it's doing so in a general way because the game is too complicated to just remember what the right thing to do is in every situation. So at this point, it's worth thinking, what is the complexity of a real-world decision? A decision you make, does it have more than 360 options available to you? Are the effects felt more than, say, three to 400 steps later? You know, when you make business decisions, and you've got a number of things to think about, and you're thinking about these over the course of a number of months, how complex are those decisions relatively? I mean, maybe they're this complex. So this has been set as the new benchmark grand challenge in AI as of about a year ago. This is the game of StarCraft II, which is a real-time strategy game. And, and for all the non-geeks out there, what happens is you play against some opponents in these very realistic settings, I mean, realistic for alien planets, and you have to gather resources with certain mining equipment, you have to build bases, you have to build defenses, you have to explore, you have to build armies and attack your opponent and destroy your opponent. This is an incredibly complicated game as well, because you don't have visibility of areas where you don't have troops stationed. So it's a very complicated game that's taken very seriously by a whole lot of gamers. In fact, many people play this professionally. And as of a couple months ago, the first AIs using the same kinds of systems started beating some professional players at this game. And in fact, in these cases, they were handicapped to have the same click speed that humans do and so on. So with these kinds of problems, we're able to now start building systems that are able to solve these as well. If you think about the kinds of problems that I've spoken to you about these games, we see an exponential increase in technology, and that's only happened over the last three years. We've gone from these simple games where some of the most complex of those old Atari games used about 17 different actions, and the games weren't that long. We moved then to Go, which has 361 actions, and the games are considerably longer. And now some of these StarCraft games can last for 20, 30 minutes, even up to an hour. They've got trillions of options available to them. They're doing all of this from the pixel level with no prior knowledge of how these games work. So what we're seeing is this huge increase in the complexity of these decision-making problems that our systems are starting to be able to solve. Now, of course, everything I've spoken about so far has been in games. And that's typically how we work with things in the research world. Um, when, you, when you're testing these algorithms out, you don't want to deal with high-stakes real-world scenarios but they're already starting to find their way into the real world. So there's a number of places where these ideas have come out already. 
They're being used to coordinate traffic lights. And this was one of the first and simplest examples where in complicated cities you can try and learn traffic light patterns across multiple intersections to minimize traffic flow at any point in time. A lot of our advertising models for good or bad current on this. So when you have something like your social media platforms throwing adverts at you, they're often optimized using these kinds of systems that are trying to keep your attention on the site for longest. And the same goes for the content that they show you. It works in a similar kind of way. Very famously, Google's using these ideas to do the temperature control in their, um, in their data centers. And this is already saving them millions of dollars just by having slightly smarter systems that are learning by themselves how to control these temperatures and regulate them up or down to, the, to fine uh, controls in the degrees just to make sure that they minimize costs while keeping it cool enough to run. And then also very excitingly, we're starting to see things like um, systems that are able to learn how to fold proteins, which is critical for drug discovery. So we're starting to see a lot of these things now coming out and designing drugs in better ways than humans have been able to do in the past. So these are some of the very early first examples of these technologies coming out into the real world. And there's a lot of other places that people have started thinking about this. You know, logistics is an obvious place. If you can think about all the different ways you can transport something from A to B, um, the different routes you could take, different points of interchange between vehicles, you can start optimizing these things. You can have your fleet learn by itself what the best thing to do at any point in time is, and think about the consequences of those decisions. This is obviously also a case in finance, where typically you might try and do something like predict what's happening on the stock market and buy or sell based on that. But now you can do, combine this with forward projections. You can think, what will the value of these things be in the future? What kind of decisions should I make? And kind of plan this out in advance based on these different kinds of strategies and taking a whole lot of different factors into account when you're doing this. Even more excitingly, I think, are the applications in healthcare, where we think about this rather than an AI system that's able to read an x-ray, you might treat your interactions with a person that comes into your clinic as a, a repeated interaction. So this person might come in every week or every month over a number of years, and if I'm trying to minimize the costs of running tests and tra changing treatments, can I come up with an optimal treatment strategy that might last for the rest of their lifetime based on conditions they have or that they might develop? So at the core of all of this, is this idea of the decision cycle. And this is how most processes work to some extent. You observe some sort of phenomenon that's happening, you try and predict what's gonna happen in the future, and then you make interventions to try and optimize something that you care about. And the way a lot of the world works at the moment is that the observations and predictions are done autonomously. We use technologies like IoT, we use a lot of AI um, to run these things, but the decisions are usually made at the human level. But where we're moving to now is this decision cycle 2.0, where the entire process is automated. And it's worth thinking at this point, what does this mean for your business? Is something like this going to disrupt you? Or is it something that could fundamentally change the way that you actually run things? Thank you very much.